All right, well, uh, thank you everybody uh, for being here. Uh, I'm Brian Clark, I'm a senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute uh, and the director of the Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, and we're here to talk about the uh, future of undersea warfare today. Uh, and uh, we're very excited to have with us some terrific guests that are uh, experts in this field from various dimensions uh, and uh, talk through this and, and uh, assess kind of where we need to go both as a US force and also how our adversaries and allies are likely to move as well in, the, in this emerging uh, important domain of uh, future military competition. So with us, uh, Jamie Fogo, uh, retired uh, US Navy Admiral, former commander of US Naval Forces Europe, uh, currently the uh, Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy over at the US Navy League. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Kevin Decker, the Chief Executive Officer of Ocean Arrow, which is a uh, company uh, down in uh, Mississippi that builds uh, unmanned surface vehicles that can also be unmanned undersea vehicles. Uh, so Kevin has a long experience in uh, the technology business as well as in uh, commercial uh, endeavors with a variety of companies, uh, including General Electric uh, and others. And then uh, last but not least, over on the end there is uh, Chuck Fralick from uh, Lidos, where he is the Chief Technology Officer for the Maritime Business and also a Technology Fellow uh, at Lidos, where he has been for uh, like a 20 year, 20 some years, right? And then previous to that, uh, he was a, a submarine officer as well as a Navy oceanographer and has a, a wealth of experience in this area and a number of patents to his name. So Chuck, thank you for being here. Uh, so the 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 uh, ostensible you know, reason that we uh, came together today was uh, Hudson recently released a study looking at the, the future of undersea warfare and the U.S., uh, the need for the U.S. to change the way that it operates in this uh, important domain. Um, the challenges uh, that we'll talk about uh, being posed by adversaries like China and Russia are making the undersea a lot less uh, uh, permissive than it has been in the past, a lot more contested. We need to think about operating differently down there to sustain the undersea advantage that the U.S. has relied upon. Uh, for the last 20 to 30 years as our sort of ace in the hole uh, when it comes to deterring uh, adversaries like Russia and China. Um, so the, the report details uh, both the threat and how it's changing, as well as opportunities for the U.S. to evolve how it uh, operates undersea by leveraging unmanned systems to a greater degree, uh, as well as using systems that both suppress and destroy undersea defenses that an opponent might put in place. In a lot of ways, this approach is like that being used by air, air warfare uh, to deal with air defenses, um, something we're seeing you know, today in Ukraine. Um, and the lack of those suppression and defeat uh, capabilities against air defenses is one of the reasons why uh, we're, we're seeing a pretty denied airspace above Ukraine. So uh, the, the undersea warfare community needs to think about evolving in a way similar to air warfare has done uh, and be able to embrace the idea of uh, using uh, capabilities that are off the ship uh, to go after the defenses that an enemy is going to use to defeat our undersea forces. So we'll talk about that today uh, with these experts. Um, so to start out, Jamie, let's you know, talk a little bit about kind of how the threat has evolved and what's, what's precipitating this need to start rethinking how we fight undersea. Um, what's happening with uh, Russia and China and kind of how do they differ in, in terms of how they're approaching the undersea domain and what capabilities they're bringing to bear? Yeah, great question, Brian, and thanks. And uh, what uh, Brian didn't say is that we've known each other for quite a long time. He was uh, in the Pentagon uh, as Admiral Greenard's 00Z for many, many years and overlapped with me when I was back there as a one-star and two-star officer at N81 and N35B. And I spent a lot of time in those jobs back and forth, kind of like a yo-yo, uh, to the front office with you and talking to Admiral Greenard. And it's interesting because that time frame is uh, uh, a time where the Chinese wanted to talk to us. And we had the Sunny Land Summit with President Obama, and uh, Brian was advising Admiral Greenard on the relationship with the Chinese, on counterpart visits with their CNO, Wu Sheng Li. And I found myself thrust into a position that I was very uncomfortable with. Uh, after Sunny Lands, uh, there were several things we were going to agree on, non-proliferation, uh, the trade uh, deficit, and the imbalance in trade between the United States and China, uh, intellectual property, and rules of behavior in the maritime domain. Uh, the Admiral called me down and he said, hey, you're going to be the representative for the Navy staff on this negotiation with the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy. And I was like, what? Well, I've never been in the Pacific before. I'm a cold warrior from the Atlantic. But you know, I took that charge with uh, enthusiasm and trained up to do it. And uh, what it netted me were several trips over to Beijing and an opportunity to uh, actually go out on their ships. So um, 
you know, you probably saw the uh, outstanding interview by Admiral Paparo on 60 Minutes about a month and a half ago, and Nora O'Donnell asked him, so, you know, when it comes to the Chinese and their submarine force, because there was a well-placed U.S. attack submarine sailing by the carrier while they were uh, filming on board, you know, are they competitive? You know, are they competitive in this, uh, in this space in the undersea domain? And he said, no, they're a generation behind us. And she said, what does that mean? You know, because a lot of people don't know what we're talking about when we say these things, acronyms, generation, what does that mean? Well, he said 10, and then he said 20 years. I don't disagree. Uh, I mean, one of the opportunities I had was to ride their brand new patrol frigate from Qingdao down to Daxidao. Daxidao is their submarine base. And uh, at that base, they have the Yuan class uh, diesel submarines. I was impressed with the Corvette um, and the price tag, which they claimed was under $200 million. And look how much it costs us to build a ship. And I said, how long did it take you to, to build this ship? Now, they said a year. I think that's probably accurate with the, uh, the industrial capacity they had then, and they have much more now. So that's kind of scary. Um, when I went down on Yuan, we were not allowed to take any photos. We were allowed to take photos every place else. So they treated their submarine force with, uh, with great respect and, uh, and security. But I was allowed to talk to the commanding officer. And the first thing I noticed was he was a little more stiff than anybody else that I had talked to. Probably a little bit nervous having these people on board from the United States. And I said, how long have you been in command? Over five years. Now we get, if we're lucky, I was lucky, three years, three deployments, all operational on USS Oklahoma City. Five years, that's pretty good. And you become a, a, a really proficient commanding officer. We all say at the end of that tour, when you walk across the brow, first thing is it's a successful tour if when you walk across the brow on your change of command, there's a band playing. And if there's not a band playing, you probably didn't have a very good tour, right? Um, so when I talked to this guy, you know, I said, uh, hey, where have you been? And he said, at sea. Uh, you know, the others in the surface Navy and on the Corvette were much more com uh, conversational. Um, where are you going to go next? Uh, wherever they tell me. And how long will you be deployed? As long as they want me. You know, so he was pretty cagey character. And I had a lot of respect for him. Uh, and he knew the ship. He knew the boat, and it was immaculate. And I think they do that on purpose, but it was, uh, it was an impressive, but it's a, it's a hybrid diesel electric submarine. You know, so it doesn't compare uh, to a Virginia class. Their Shang nuclear boats do not compare to a Virginia class. But since that time, we got the Rules of Behavior Agreement signed. It was part of the ASEAN Summit in 2015. And I thought, gee, we done good, and maybe we can coexist in the Western Pacific. And then when I got to Sixth Fleet and watched the numbers, it's the greatest naval armaments race I have ever seen in my 40 years. There are 360 ships right now. They have a hypersonic weapon, the DF-17. They have ballistic missiles that uh, provide a very impressive anti-access area denial capability. It's not just first and second island chain. We're talking about well out into uh, the South China Sea. And uh, you know, my friend Chaz Richard, when he finished up at STRATCOM, talked about the nuclear breakout. Some wild numbers there. I think the open literature tells you they have about 350 nukes. They're going to something north of 3,000. And we and the Russians combined in New START have about 3,100 missiles. And uh, they're not in any arms control scheme whatsoever. So it's a big concern. But I support what Admiral Paparo said. They're a generation behind us in undersea warfare. Now let's shift gears and go to Russia. So uh, as Commander Sixth Fleet, as Commander Naval Forces Europe, I became very familiar with the Russian SSGN Severod Vetsk, and they've since produced another one. Throughout all of the turmoil in Russia, the surface Navy doesn't amount to much. You saw what happened to the Moskva. They had every opportunity, every weapon system, defensive capability on that ship to save that ship from two air-breathing cruise missiles that the Ukrainians modified. But they didn't even have their radars uncaged from the astern position looking down the threat axis. That's complacency. That's ignorance. And when they were hit, they couldn't fight the fire or stop the flooding. They don't have non-commissioned officers, and they have conscripts that didn't know what they were doing, and leadership didn't help. They lost their flagship. So they haven't put a lot of stock 
in the surface Navy. Their one carrier, Kuznetsov, is a disaster. You know, it's, it's like a platform to practice firefighting on because it always catches fire. It falls through dry docks. It makes smoke. You could see it across the Atlantic. So not impressive. In the submarine force, however, the design bureau uh, receives a lot of money and they put a lot of research and development in, into these ships. Severodvinsk is very impressive. It's a very quiet platform, but it can't beat a Virginia. No way. I'll put a paycheck on that. So we've got to keep that competitive edge, and that's what you've done in your paper. The other Russian submarine that scares me is Belgorod. So Belgorod's on sea trials, I don't know, up in the White Sea someplace. Uh, if, you, if you read the Barents Observer, the Norwegian newspaper that talks a lot about That's the new ballistic missile submarine. Yeah, right. well, it's a dual use. Yeah. So it has, it has, right, it has, uh, Putin leaked this information about a torpedo called the Poseidon torpedo. It's like 65 feet long. I mean, who makes a torpedo that long? It's supposed to have dual capable propulsion, you know, like a nuclear propulsion plant and it could have a, a dual capable warhead. And the whole purpose of that weapon is to, according to Putin and his cronies, cross the Atlantic and threaten us. Um, it does concern me, uh, but that's one mission for the ship. The other one is it's got a little nuclear mini sub in its, its belly. And uh, I worry about undersea critical infrastructure. You know, 90% of our stuff, our commerce, goes on the surface of the sea, but 95% of our critical communications go under the sea on these cables that can join all of our allies, partners, friends, and even our adversaries in that network. And so I'll close on, you know, Alfred Thayer Mahan came up with the term sea lines of communication uh, at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, or the 19th to the 20th century, uh, 1800 to 1900. I think before he died, one cable was being laid across the Atlantic at that time. But he had no idea that in the 21st century, the most important sea line of communication would be on the bottom of the ocean that, that links our military communications and our market communications. Can you imagine what would happen if uh, something happened there? What, what would happen to our markets? They go haywire. So we've got to protect that. And a lot of the ideas in your paper, Brian, are provocative. Uh, I agree with the majority of them, some of them uh, I'd like to hear more from you about. I, I think they're great. But uh, yeah, there is a big threat in the undersea. And uh, perhaps these gentlemen can help us out with a little bit of hybrid and a little bit of unmanned or uncrewed, right. the more, more correct term right. that you use, uh, uncrewed systems for the future. Well, thank you, Jamie. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, uh, Chuck, you know, Jamie brings up the, I mean, so subsea and seabed warfare, so the particularly seabed warfare. Uh, a growing area of concern, um, both in terms of how it might be used against us, but also how we might employ it against an opponent. Uh, in the report, we talk about the need for the U.S. to field more capabilities for seabed warfare so that we can go after enemy sensors, uh, sensors that might be on the seafloor like a Chinese version of SOSIS or a Russian version, version of SOSIS, um, or to go after you know, communication networks that they're going to need to maintain their military you know, capabilities. Uh, or to go after um, you know, some of the uh, you know, mines that might be placed on the seafloor or at least anchored to the seafloor. So this idea of being able to fight in the seabed and uh, in, the, in the undersea against unmanned systems is going to be an important element of, of future undersea warfare. Um, how do we need to think about the capabilities you'd need to do those kinds of operations? Because you know, clearly uh, a submarine is not necessarily the right tool to go after you know, network uh, connections on the seafloor or a sonar array on the seafloor or a mine that's hanging in the, in the water column? Well, clearly the, the path we're headed down, well, number one, using exquisitely expensive crude platforms like $3 billion submarines is not the best utilization of that capability. They're there to fight wars, shoot weapons, and shoot bad guys. So if, if, you, if you take submarines out of the equation, you focus on unmanned or uncrewed, what we really lack, what we, what we need to get to is multi-mode platforms that can do a variety of things in the subsea seabed warfare environment. And that's kinetic and non-kinetic. So imagine, you know, cutting cables. Everybody knows that that's in the open press. And there are examples of that that have already occurred in Norway, for example. So having the ability to get deep with persistence and command and control is, is the stage we want to get to. We have pieces of that now. I mean, the Boeing Orca 
the, the Navy's Orca platform, which is XLUV, is, is a wonderfully engineered platform. It's got huge range and payload. But it's probably not where we want it to be for the effects-based piece of it. We are working on programs that are bringing those effects to the table. They take a long time. They're very expensive. But the ultimate goal, and it also includes, I know everybody's enamored with the term AI and generative AI, that AI is really what's going to enable us to take less than perfect sensing of what's going on and turn that into actionable intelligence. So I'm all for AI, and the faster we can get there, the better we're off we're going to be. So I think it's the confluence of undersea vehicle technology, sensing technology, AI as it relates to improving the picture with sparse information, and we'll get there. We have all the tools to do that within our military industrial complex. So uh, we'll get to why, why we have not done that yet then as a subsequent question. But just to follow up on that, um, you, you talked about sensing and the need to use AI to enable us to get a better picture, particularly in the underwater environment. Um, you know, it seems like you know, a key mission that the U.S. is going to need to mount is a, what we would call intelligence preparation of the environment. And this would be both either for China or Russia. We need to understand where their undersea sonar arrays might be, where they might have placed mines, where they might have communication networks that we might want to interrupt, um, not just to uh, interrupt, you know, damage them or attack them, uh, but also if we want to try to jam them or, or deceive them. We kind of need to know where the sensors are because an unmanned undersea vehicle is not necessarily going to be big or loud enough to do that unless you place it close to the sensor you're trying to influence. Um, how, how, how are we going to be able to get that kind of high fidelity picture? I mean, is it something where you just go send a bunch of unmanned under, uh, uncrewed undersea vehicles out to mow the grass and, and do that? Or you know, is there a smarter way to do it? And what kinds of vehicles are we going to need to go down and operate in those conditions? Because you're talking, in some cases, tens of thousands of feet below the water. Right. So the first thing is a priori knowledge of where the potential infrastructure you're going after is. We can't search the whole ocean for that. It's a very large ocean. Once you have a reasonably accurate location, and, and that can be tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers even, then you can apply the resources. And we have some wonderful tools today. Uh, synthetic aperture sonar. You're talking 1,500 foot swaths of imagery, and it's backscatter imagery, much like a photograph looks, and you can resolve three-inch objects at those ranges. So the infrastructure we're looking for, of course, is much larger than that. So it becomes a reasonable proposition, providing you can get vehicles to the depth required, and that's varying ocean depths, everywhere from probably deep, really deep water, full ocean depth, to the littorals. Uh, the vehicles, it, it's a misconception that we don't have the technology in the vehicles today. Lots of companies build very good underwater platforms. The challenges we still have today are energy, and it's not just energy to go from point A to point B. Just, just pick a number and say you're in 10,000 feet of water. That excursion from the surface down to that depth is a long time and takes a lot of energy, and your navigation picture is not good in between the surface and the bottom. Once you get to the bottom, we have other tools, like Doppler velocity logs that lock to the bottom and they track the motion across the bottom, coupled with inertial systems. And those navigation solutions are very good. But in between, we're not so good. So developing tools that improve that picture from the surface to the bottom is, is one thing. Energy is another. And then command and control at depth is a persistent challenge for us there is acoustic communications. RF energy doesn't propagate through the water. Well, it does for about that much. Uh, so we need to solve those three pieces, better navigation solutions, better energy capacity on the vehicles. You know, being an ex-nuke, <clears throat> the Admiral would agree, you know, nuclear would be a great way to go, but it's not politically <laughs> palatable. So we're going to have to figure out better energy solutions. And then finally, the communications piece has got to be solved to enable retasking, uh, correction of location, you know, if there's an error in your navigation, things of that nature. And we're on the cusp of doing probably all of those today. Right. And so, um, you know, Kevin, you guys build uncrewed vehicles, so you, you live this world. Uh, and you know, your vehicle in particular um, has this ability to transition from being a surface vehicle to an undersea vehicle. Um, you know, but Chuck's pointed out some of the challenges, or and maybe the opportunities here, 
um, to think about how we might either use multiple unmanned vehicles or uncrewed vehicles to pursue a, a survey operation uh, where it may not be just you know, one vehicle goes down and tries to find everything. You have to use a family of vehicles. Um, yeah, how would you envision maybe doing that? And, and you know, what, is the, what have you guys found in terms of addressing the technical challenges that Chuck has identified? Yeah, well, the first part of that, um, Brian, I think is the notion that we don't have to have just one or two really expensive unmanned platforms. And I think as part of the report that was released, it's, what I don't think we ought to do is replicate what a crewed vessel is today, right? I think that would be a, a less good outcome, okay? And I think it would be twice as expensive of doing that. And so I have always been a fan of kind of what we'd call distributed power, right? The ability to feel large numbers of smaller, more attritable things. Not that you want to lose anything, but if you do, the more distributed you are in nature, uh, one, reduces the reliance on any one given unit. And then two, uh, kind of lends you to a faster turn time on change detection and iterations and, and that sort of thing. And when you do that, suddenly you need less power, less endurance for any particular feel. You don't have to go from Honolulu to the South China Sea. You can just go from a smaller distributed standpoint. Um, so I think if we change our thinking to, oh, this is a $5 million asset, this is a $100 million asset, you know, we only have 10 of them, how do we do that con ops? What if you had 5,000 of them, right? And you have them distributed in a constant surveillance pattern that reduces the reliance on any particular energy intensive event. Now, I agree with Chuck, you're not gonna go down to the bottom of the ocean with any of these smaller, you know, lesser capable platforms. And then the question is, um, something else that I think that you raised in the report is do you need to? If you can confuse the sensors, if you can find choke points and disable those choke points of those long cables, if you can make a lot of noise and and confuse detection patterns, whether it's a submarine or a mine or something else, would you be able to uh, disrupt its ability to act? And I think that's pretty important. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, you could get away with suppressing the sensor rather than destroying it, which might, you know, if you do it at a significant enough noise level, you might be able to avoid having to identify exactly where it is, right? Just generate enough noise to overcome it. Exactly. So, Jamie, you know, the, this discussion sort of in the, the, what we talked about in the report a little bit about the changing nature of anti-submarine warfare, and that was one of the big drivers behind what we thought was the need for a change in how the submarine force that we both came from uh, operates. Um, so how, um, yeah, how do you see anti-submarine warfare changing? You mentioned going on the, the Corvette, the Jingdao, mm -hmm. which those have variable depth, uh, yeah. low-frequency active sonars, which in theory should be very good. Right. Um, you know, we, we use them on our own Surtash ships. Uh, so as, as we see active start to take a more, you know, prominent role in anti-submarine warfare, uh, and as we see, you know, shi uh, more ships that are capable of, of deploying it, as well as what we're seeing in terms of anti-access uh, anti capabilities, I guess I would say, underwater, you know, where you might see the Chinese use, you know, the same kind of approach they use above the water, where they get a detection and they just launch weapons at it. You know, there's no attempt to do a prosecution. They're just trying to make the submarine go away. Mm -hmm. do, do you think th those start to create a different environment for us to operate in compared to what we experienced during the Cold War when it was much more of a cat and mouse game? Yeah, you know, and uh, again, I go back to uh, a few years ago when you and I were working for uh, Admiral Greenert, and he used to uh, chastise both of us all the time when we talk about this cat and mouse game, <laughs> sub on sub, and yeah. reminiscing <laughs> with our hands. It, we, we love Top Gun Maverick, you know, those guys, they all talk with their hands like this, and so submariners said, well, we want to be cool like that too, so you're doing this training exercise down in Autech, and there's another 688 <laughs> out there. And, you know, the boss would have nothing to do with it. He's like, you guys, you always think that the best platform to find an enemy submarine is one of our submarines. That's just dead wrong. Now, you know, I hadn't heard a submariner say that. He's a submariner. And I was like, sir, well, you know, what do you mean? What are you talking about? That's, that's, that's heresy. He goes, no, it's a combined arms effort. It's got to be national technical means. It's got to be... Uh, marine patrol reconnaissance aircraft. That's why we pay $250 million a piece for the Poseidon. And when we were doing budget drills with uh, the boss, he would say, uh, four P8s equals a billion. So I know how many I can cut if I need a billion right. dollars, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so it is this combined arms approach. And eventually, if you have the proper queuing, yeah, the best thing to kill another submarine is another submarine, particularly ours with the Mark 48 torpedo. Thank goodness nobody has come up with a torpedo that good, and we continue to improve it, and we need to continue to improve it. What I find provocative about your thesis, and, and the thing that I told you, there's, I agree with 85% of what mm -hmm. you said, 
But you said in the paper, hey, we need to go from uh, being the silent surface to making noise. That's going to be, you know, old habits are hard to break. That's going to be very hard to convince submariners to do. I'm with you on that. I, I think I get what you're saying. You're saying we've got to be, we've got to go active more. You know, we have to insonify the ocean and find out where the targets are out there and then put precision strike uh, weapon systems on those targets. You're right, the Chinese and the Russians. The Russians and the Chinese take a, a grad rocket approach. Right. Oh, he's over there. Fire everything you got. <laughs> you know, that's not a precise right. American uh, tactic, technique, or procedure. We want to kill him, you know, put the bullet on the bullet, right? And so, in sonifying the ocean, wow, that, what happens there, you're going to give away your footprint. They're going to know where you're at. It's like a, a submarine launching a tomahawk. There's, there's a trail behind that right. missile as it goes out, you know, so you're going to have to beat feet. The other thing you said was, hey, we need to go from this uh, hunter-killer uh, mode to a using a submarine in a reconnaissance and strike mode. That's an interesting thesis. I'd like to hear more about that. First of all, you're going to have a tough time, Brian, with Hollywood because right. there's movies out there called <laughs> Hunter Killer, uh, you know, with the guy that did the 300, the Australian. <laughs> uh, that's going to be tough. But reconnaissance and strike. And so I don't know uh, how uh, we would take a Virginia class or a 688 and turn it into a reconnaissance and strike weapon system. We are doing a lot with unmanned aerial vehicles now. We're over the horizon. Uh, you know, I read the other day the French, uh, op open literature thing, the French launched and controlled a UAV from a French submarine. And I was like, wow. I actually remember USS Chicago was just decommissioned about a week ago when Chicago did that in 1987, because that was a big deal. Admiral Jim Bastiani was down at Sublent, and it was a big deal. So 1987 to present to get to you know an ally doing that too. So uh, interested in your thoughts? Yeah. So the the idea was that as uh, China and Russia start to use their you know the capabilities they have to ex you know, use this more just fire for effect mm -hmm. you know approach where they're going to see what they think is a submarine launch weapons at it make the submarine evade, you know, mm -hmm. and then you're, that'll give you better contact information than you can go maybe prosecute it. Or the submarine goes away and you're successful regardless because you were just trying to break off its attack. You know, that's been successful in previous campaigns. That's how we won the Battle of the Atlantic, or I guess the U.S. and the, the Allies won the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, was because they were able to cause German and, and Italian submarines to go away. I mean, if you look at late in the war, there yeah. weren't that many kills. It was much more about driving the submarines away. Turning point, 1942. Right, exactly. And so the, the, the question is, you know, could Russia and China exploit a similar approach once we start you know, launching weapons or, you know, launching weapons inside uh, the South China Sea, East China Sea, or, you know, operate up in the Barents and try to launch some kind of payload, we'll get detected, they'll launch weapons at us, you know, we have to break off, and then the, the submarine's utility gets significantly reduced. So it becomes marginalized. And so the question is, well, how do we avoid that? You know, well, so one way to avoid it is to, you know, use decoys, jammers, generate a lot of noise out there, Try not to reveal the location of your submarine, you know, unnecessarily, but make it a lot harder for them to find you. Even once you've started to launch weapons and you begin to create a more complex environment under sea, so try to make it so our submarines can get to where they need to be to launch weapons, and then make them better able to persist in that environment, despite the fact that the enemy is now alerted to their presence. You know, you said something else in there too, and I thank you for uh, the uh, explanation of your thoughts. You said. Uh, you know, what the submarine force needs, what that skipper needs, is something like an Aegis right. uh, fire control system. That includes the radar, the processing, you know, the connectivity of the weapon systems. And then, like an SM-6, which is the uh, standard missile 6, very, very effective weapon used by the surface Navy as kind of a, you know, counter-battery fire, anti-ship missile. You put that in the bridge of a ship, that ship's going to stop and it's not going to bother you anymore. And I thought a lot about that, and I think you're right there. I think, you know, when when we go, we have not succeeded. And I've heard this all my life, uh, since I was a midshipman. We're going to make the oceans transparent. We're trying. There's a lot of technology out there. We talk about stuff like blue green lasers. Been around for a long time. We have and we have water depth, and we have problems in the lit between the littoral and blue water. We have not yet been able to make the oceans transparent. We talked about data rates of RF. Uh, 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 information, you know, it doesn't go very far. Uh, we have yet to conquer that challenge 
and Admiral Jim Bastiani used to talk about this, uh, comms at speed and depth. No matter how fast you're going, that submarine can get information. And we, we have made some strides, but what you want and what you're proposing, Brian, in that Aegis underwater combat system is uh, a brilliant common operating picture for that commanding officer. So he knows where good guys are and bad guys are. And uh, you know, when some, it's, it's like a knife fight. In a knife fight, the first guy to strike usually wins, right? You wound the opponent and then he's weaker. And uh, if somebody strikes you first, the tendency is to get the hell out of Dodge right. and come back to fight another day. Right. Right. You would like to have that common operating picture to say, well, maybe if I maneuver and I stay over here, I can keep away from this right. guy, right. but I'm going after the high value unit there. Right. And so you can stand and fight. The idea is yeah. you can you yeah. defend yourself, because normally submarines have to leave if they get shot at, right. um, because you don't want to stand around. You don't, you don't go fast enough. You don't have the good sensors. You don't have any capability to necessarily shoot back. So you really have to leave and regain your stealth uh, rather than stand and fight. I, maybe I, would, can... I would qualify that just to yeah. say for the submariners out right. there yeah. and uh, you know, uh, Chuck and is a submariner like me. Um, there, it's a risk calculus, right? right? So you're not gonna run away. We, you know, our colors right. never run. But if you're, you got a 0% or a 5% chance of winning right. and, and maybe taking a hit, you're probably not gonna take those odds. You know, uh, Admiral Meese, when he was Commander Meese, my first CO on CETO, he used to say, hey, it's this World War II philosophy of O'Kane and Morton and all those guys. If you got a better than 50% chance of success, in a wartime scenario, take it, go for it, right? So there, there's a risk there, but you got a better than 50% chances. But you'd raise those odds if you have the ability to shoot back, you know, yeah. take out torpedoes that sure. are coming at you, better understand the picture. So, so Kevin, you know, to, to you know, Jamie's point about you know, maintaining constant speed and depth, this is obviously a challenge you guys work on or you know, address <laughs> because you've got a vehicle that operates on the surface, has to go undersea, and if we want to be able to do some of these you know, operations where we're going to use uncrewed vehicles to do decoy or jamming, sure. uh, or even you know, go try to find mines that are up in front of the submarine that might prevent it from getting somewhere. A vehicle, you know, you, if you operate on the surface and you can go underwater, that's great for comms. You get a really good comms link, and then you go under. So how do you guys handle that, uh, maintaining the, the situational awareness of that vehicle once it goes underwater? Yeah, yeah sure. Look, it's a common problem, as, as Chuck pointed out. Look, I think uh, advancements in acoustic communications and laser communications will continue to get better. We'll continue to integrate those. Uh, part of what I was talking about before around having the many fewer um, high cost, high complexity assets enable you to have multiple nodes on the surface and underwater to be able to breach that air water barrier. So if you have hundreds underneath or dozens underneath and dozens on the surface, they'll all be able to communicate up and down throughout the water column, limited cones, Right. But at least you can do it. And I, and I think what the Admiral points out around this combined arms concept is absolutely right. It's Even if you could do that in a conflict environment, you're going to lose your constellation of satellites up there. And so these MQ-9s mm -hmm. or something that are all broadcasting mesh radio networks mm -hmm. um, from high altitudes, well, now all of a sudden you have something that's not a satellite that's harder to shoot down, at least instantaneously, that can then cone a very large geography. And so now our Tritons can communicate back to the top. Um, back into land and then also down below. So at some point, you are going to be limited to this, this water problem that doesn't propagate energy uh, very uh, readily. But there are certainly technologies that allow you to do this. And, and as Chuck points out, it costs you a lot of power to go up and down. Okay, right. little known fact, it's hard to take a submarine down. It takes a lot of power. And so really, you know, as, as Chuck says, the problem of power management, battery management, power collection, solar collection, this ability to recharge your batteries mm -hmm. is pretty critical, right? You're not gonna be able to endure underwater for any degree of more than hours and days, even in an unmanned system where you don't have life support, unless you're able to recharge your power, which is why we focus a lot on our rechargeability and the capability of being both a surface and subsurface vehicle. It enables us to overcome that power management problem. You no longer have to worry about running out of a, any fuel source, diesel, hydrogen, whatever it's gonna be, um, so that you can persist for a longer period of time. So the combination of these new communication devices and this power generation and then this in combination with other types of aerial assets allow you to have a, a very high definition kind of communications rate. So, so Kevin, one, one thing that, uh, you know, the aerial environment, like we're seeing with Ukraine, could get very contested very quickly. Um, and uh, it could be difficult to maintain like an MQ-9 or an MQ-4 sure. right above these areas. 
Um, so could you actually maintain a mesh network using unmanned sy unmanned yeah, exactly. surface vehicles all the way from shore out to wherever the That's exactly what you do, right? Okay. It's just, uh, you know, you kind of go in different tiers, satellites and then MQ-9 in the sky. And, and then to your point, again, breaking your thinking away from, oh, I've got 10 launched from a ship. No, no, no. Right. You need 10,000 across everything north and south of Taiwan that has the ability to daisy chain, is what it's right. called, right? Back and forth, your, mesh, your own mesh radio network right. uh, kind of communications grid. And then, as you know, as everyone probably knows this, right, it's, you're limited by horizon. The signals yeah. do propagate over the surface of the ocean right. for quite a, a long distance, actually. But it doesn't take very much height on the deck of any type of our own allied ships that enable you to really get some range out there. We just did one in the Gulf of Mexico with a, with a commercial customer of ours, and we were able to go dozens and dozens and dozens of miles with a single point of one of our uh, wow. vehicles, let alone a fleet of them. And so you have options in, in different tiers. And you've been able to maintain the acoustic communications to you know, you know, talk with uh, vehicles that are submerged you know, from vehicles that are surfaced. And it's still evolving, right? right We're gonna right. continue to get better at that. But it, I'd say it's not, um, as, as Chuck says, I think it's a misconception to say that those technologies don't exist, right? right? They exist. Integrating them, working on them, coding them, being right. able to fit into a con ops, I think is the trick of it which is why I think our military complex needs to continue to propagate that type of R&D activity, but not just in an isolated environment, in an operational environment, which I think we're seeing more of. So, so Chuck, the, you know, so I, you know, I could see the utility you know, of Kevin's you know, large distributed you know, network of relatively unsophisticated vehicles and how it might be useful for you know, maintaining communications, doing some of the jamming and decoy type of operations. Um, there are going to be some very, you know, kind of more sophisticated, specialized missions like, you know, mine hunting, you know, that we might need to do with a UUV. And this is one of the areas that the submarine forces identified as, as a big problem is, you know, if a, a country like a China or Russia puts mines in the water in an area where we want to take the submarine, you know, that's going to be challenging. And, and to find the mines, you know, the submarine's going to have to either reveal its location, which makes, makes it really hard for the enemy to engage, um, or someone else will have to find the mines, which might be hard to do in a place like the Taiwan Strait in a wartime uh, condition. So it, it, can we use UUVs? Can the submarine launch UUVs? I mean, you guys are working on uh, medium UUV, which is the Navy's new like, Razorback program, which is going to be a you know, deployable and recoverable UUV. Is that an application you could see uh, Razorback being applied against? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, <clears throat> Razorback, if, if you're familiar with the Navy program offices, this is PMS-406 and PMS-408. So PMS-406 handles unmanned systems as a general rule. 408 is the expeditionary warfare guys that handle mine countermeasures for the surface fleet, explosive ordnance disposal types of things. So MUV is a program that is going to span both communities. So they will have a lot of commonality. And part of that commonality is the sensing suite. They're going to be equipped with synthetic aperture sonars, and part of their mission is to find mines and other nefarious packages on the bottom so that we can neutralize those or avoid them. So absolutely, that's a, that is absolutely a part of the future of, of EUVs in the military. And, and would the idea with the Razorback be that it's communicating back to the submarine via like a fiber optic cable or something to give you, because of course if you're using acoustic communications, you're not getting a whole lot of data. Well, there, there's some things I'm not at liberty I mean, to say, yeah, but uh, it, it, the idea that we're gonna have a tether back to, to the boat, the submarine, is, is not likely. Right, okay. Uh, submarines, in fact, one of the whole purposes of having call them organic underwater vehicle assets on board fast attack submarines, is that they can launch UVs, they can retask to do something else that has higher importance and allow the UV to continue doing its job for some period of time. Once that sortie is complete, they recover, they rendezvous, they recover into the torpedo tube, right. which is the holy grail of UVs from a submarine, and they go about, about their way. So it's really the independent ops of the two platforms is what expands the capability yeah. of the submarine. And, but you would see that, I mean, I, in the report we talk about that kind of mission where the submarine is launching its own UUVs as sort of being niche applications and that the bulk of the UUVs that we be putting into the environment would probably be coming from another platform like, or from shore because you, know, you, don't necess you don't necessarily want the submarine having to do the launch event, which could be detectable, and also the submarine's got limited capacity on board. Uh, and then, of course, the UUVs have a limited range and, and, and speed, so they can't get very far away from the submarine. So if it's a decoy or a jammer, you don't want it hanging around the submarine while it's doing that. Right. 
So it seems like a lot of those operations should be done from off board. Where access. possible. Right, where right. possible. If, so. if, you're, if you're in a denied area, right. you can't have surface platforms yeah, tending point. underwater vehicles. Right. You really have little choice. Right. You either have very long range underwater vehicles like Orca, right. but they are incredibly expensive, or you go with higher end, so large end, Admiral Sobrowski used to love that term, so large numbers of these things out there doing a particular job because the you know, volume or mass has a quality all of its own when it comes to sensing or weapons or anything. So yes, uh, if we can avoid it, we don't want to put a submarine in, in a denied area where it has to do those types of right. operations right. because the indiscretion of doing launch or recovery is not something that I think the Admiral would relish doing in wartime. So. Yeah. Uh, it, it brings back memories of yeah. uh, Baltops 2015, 2016. I was lucky, it was six fleets, so I commanded that exercise twice. And a big part of that exercise was uh, mine countermeasures with the standing NATO mine countermeasures group. Uh, headed by the Germans, they had a, a mine countermeasures command ship. And at that point, we were just starting to get into unman unmanned systems that you could toss over the side of a rib or control from a mine countermeasures ship to go down and find a mine and then put a shaped charge on it and explode it. An observation from the Baltic, there's a million mines on the bottom of the Baltic because of World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. And now you're seeing the same thing recur in the Black Sea. There were mines from the First and Second World War and the Cold War. Now the Russians and Ukrainians have put more mines in there. We found, I think, 60 to 65 floating, free-floating mines this year. The Romanians sent out one of their uh, mine sweepers to uh, find a floating mine near the ships in Constanta that were waiting to depart port. And they responsibly uh, reacted because they're the de facto host nation. And they lost the mine sweeper because it hit the mine. And so these remote systems uh, are not only good because they're less expensive, but you know much less risk for the people who are manning uh, mine sweepers nowadays and tremendous applicability. I'm very excited about what you guys are doing. I want to say one other thing. Talk about energy a lot. Yeah. You know, there's a guy that comes to see me from Core Power all the time, uh, and uh, he knows uh, my battle buddy John Richardson and former CNO Tony Houston. Small modular reactors. I mean, those things are pretty impressive. And we're not talking about uh, we're talking about liquid molten fuels that are not at high pressure. And so, if you could figure out how to get them, no Three Mile Island. Yeah. Yeah. And. You know, I'm a believer, I'm a nuke, I'm a believer. Brian, uh, we'll brief you up, but uh, yeah, I think that may be the answer uh, to some of these systems that require uh, independent power for a long period of time. Yeah, that's a terrific idea. I mean, there's certainly, you know, like thorium and then uh, yeah. liquid motor Data batteries. Reactors. You know, there's yeah. lots of options. Yeah, what, what he's alluding to is naval reactors uh, is, for all intents and purposes, the god of nuclear power in the United States. Whatever they decree usually happens. They're not big fans of using nuclear power for anything but warships. So it's a tough row to hoe to get them to accept systems like that, but I think it's inevitable. Well, you know what, I gotta say this, because I, you know, we're all, three of us here are the products of the program, nukes, and uh, I worked there for Admiral Bowman for, uh, for two years of my life as a ZA. Uh, that guy was brilliant. He came up with the four gets. I don't know if we'll have time to get there. But I give Admiral Caldwell, my classmate, we were in the same company for four years, incredible credit for working through the uh, AUKUS deal. I mean, I never yes. thought we would transfer technology to another country, nuclear submarine technology. I mean, we've been, we've been doing this with the Brits and kind of a shared thing, but they're our, our best ally. And now to do it with AUKUS, so they've really, I think naval reactors have really kind of come a long way. Uh, I agree, and we'll talk about AUKUS in a second. I want to remind the group that uh, I'm going to take questions from the audience. So if you have questions, uh, you know, let me know. I'm going to call on you in just a second, and we can bring those into the into the conversation. Uh, you know, Jamie, you brought up you know AUKUS, and um, we just completed a, a study for the Navy that was aligned, you know, part of uh, AUKUS Pillar Two, which looks at unmanned systems and other technologies. Um, you know, but what uh, you know, what will AUKUS, at least in the you know, just thinking about the first couple phases, you know, will we start deploying more submarines to operate out of uh, Australia and then maybe eventually sell Australia some U.S. built submarines? You know, what might that do in terms of improving the Allies' ability to, um, you know, retain an undersea superiority? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I'm a big presence guy. I write about it all the time. Some people don't like what I say about forward presence. Uh, you know, we don't 
We don't build navies to, to maintain presence, we build navies to fight wars, so therefore we should husband our resources and stay home and you know, isolate ourselves. Wrong answer. You gotta be out there doing intelligence preparation of the environment, the IPOE that's in your paper. And the other thing you do is we're never gonna fight a war alone. We're gonna fight wars uh, in a coalition you know, with uh, partners and allies and coalitions of the willing. Maybe they're not in an alliance with us like NATO or uh, AUKUS, but they're willing to defend their sovereign territory. And you see that in the Pacific, and you see that in Europe right now in spades with the war in Ukraine. So I think by proliferating uh, Virginia-class submarine technology to a country like Australia, we give ourselves more reach. We give ourselves more presence. And uh, we also give ourselves incredible flexibility and agility, and eventually, that program will go from the Virginia class to a combined submarine between Australia and the United Kingdom. And there will be a sustained program with X number of boats. I don't know what X's are gonna end up being. Uh, but it'd be great to have allies and partners out there in one of these stealthy platforms looking for the kinds of things that you just talked about earlier in, uh, in this, you know, where, where is the adversary? Where is the nefarious activity? Where, where are the things happening that we don't like that we want to prevent or deter? Yeah, so uh, audience uh, questions. If anyone has a question, uh, raise your hand. We'll bring the mic around to you. Um, sir, in the second row. Um, so uh, just let us know who you are and where you're from, what your affiliation is. Good afternoon. My name is Greg. Uh, I was a surface warfare officer for about five years down in Norfolk. Just left. Uh, now I'm working at SPA on the AUKUS deal. Uh, I have two questions for the Admiral. Uh, the first one is about the industrial capacity of our Navy. Um, are you satisfied with what we're doing to build the amount of ships we're supposed to and submarines uh, to ensure that we can maintain our political objectives around the globe? The reason why I ask this is there's a lot of ships, you know, the ones that are operational, they stay out to sea a long time. And the ones who enter the yards seem to stay in the yards for a long time. And this affects morale. Uh, and uh, I'm, it's one of the reasons why we have a ret retention issue right now. It definitely affected my decision to get out of the Navy, one of, many, one of, one of different reasons. Uh, so that's one question. And then speaking of the AUKUS deal, um, do you think that if there is a conflict between the United States and China, the Australians would actually intervene and fight alongside us? Because I'm sure that's also part of the calculus as to why this deal was signed, to have them help us in the Pacific if something like that happens. But as far as I know, there is no treaty that binds them to us um, to fight a war against China if, if need be. Thanks. Yeah. Jamie? Um, so first of all, uh, Greg and I chatted beforehand here and. Uh, formerly a surface warfare officer. Glad you're doing good work with SPA. And he's a, a Rachel Gosnell trained man. <laughs> so Commander Rachel Gosnell was my speechwriter much more than that when I was over in Europe for three years. Absolutely fantastic and currently in Garmisch and doing great things as a foreign area officer. And she's an expert on Russia and fluently speaks the language. So great to see you, Greg. Great questions. Hey, on the industrial capacity, um, this is a really tough problem for this country. There's a book out there called uh, uh, Freedom's Forge that Admiral John Richardson had recommended I read. And if you look at it, uh, you know, about, we started a naval uh, production program about 1938, thinking that things were not going well in the Pacific. And thank God we did that because we were down to like one carrier by 42. But we turned the tide and won the Battle of Midway and won the war. Uh, during that war, we had 56 shipyards on the East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast of this country. When President Reagan came in in the 80s with Cap Weinberger, we had 19 yards. Today we have seven. So our industrial base is atrophied because we believe globalization would allow us to outsource everything, and now we found out that that was probably the wrong strategy. And we're trying to catch up. Uh, you know, I was just on the Hill. Uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, discussions with uh, professional staff and members. We've got a schoolhouse in our uh, CMS next month, we got about 30 professional staffers coming over. I was up with a representative talking about the industrial base. And the answer is not build more industrial base. You know, if you had a magic wand and said, give me a shipyard right here, you've got to put people in that shipyard that have the skills 
to be able to build the ships or repair the ships. And it's just like military recruiting. Everybody's competing. I mean, the job market is hot right now. So you're competing for folks to do really hard work in nasty places. And uh, it's pretty cold in the dry dock down in Norfolk in the wintertime. So you've got to resource them, train them, and uh, keep their morale and their motivation up. And that's, uh, that's not an easy task. But that is something that should be a national task for this country. It's going to be a national security problem if we can't keep those shipyards rolling. We're having a problem with readiness. There was an article two weeks ago about the submarine force and having, uh, you know, I, I think it was like 40% of uh, our active force uh, is behind schedule uh, in shipyards. That's got to change. We've got to get them out. We've got to build more boats. We're supposed to be building two Virginias a year. We're really building, according to the Congressional Research Service, about 1.2 Virginias a year. The real number in Brian's paper is three to four uh, Virginias or SS and X's a year. Um, you know, I heard a number earlier of $3 billion for Virginia that SSNX is estimated by your numbers and other people's numbers at $6 billion. Wow, that's unsustainable. So industrial base is a problem. Labor is a problem, and we've got to get a grip on that. On uh, the conflict with China and Australia, you know, uh, probably one of the greatest experts on AUKUS and how the Australians think is Dr. Charlie Adele. Uh, he is... Uh, uh, over at uh, CSIS. CSIS, and I've been over there, and he's come over and done podcasts with John Richardson and I. And you know, we're talking about the motivation of the Australian people. Uh, a few years ago, when China decided they didn't like, uh, you know, Australia's national security strategy, their movement uh, uh, to patrol their sovereign economic zone waters and help others in uh, Western Pacific who are being disenfranchised by some of the. Chinese reach out into these rock shoals and islands that they've now turned into stationary aircraft carriers. The retaliation against Australia was in goods and services, and I think the Chinese just basically cut off all wine imports from Australia. The Australians did not like that. And that was kind of, it's funny, right? Wine imports, that was a wake-up call for them. And uh, I think there's solidarity down there that they need to do something differently. And I think there's solidarity that they need a submarine force that is capable like ours, and by God, they're going to get one through the AUKUS agreement. And I haven't seen any blowback there yet. This is moving along very nicely. We just had the first two Australian uh, officers graduate from nuclear power school. There are two more. I was talking to the attache a few weeks ago. I said, how are they doing? Oh, mate, hardest thing they've ever done in their life. I can sympathize. I, I did many, many extra hours on weekends studying. So I think they're... Uh, they're on board, and I think if China uh, pulls a fast one, we can count on the Australians as close allies and partners. So uh, I, I agree. I, we were just down there a couple months ago for our study, uh, and that was the unit. The unity was pretty impressive uh, yeah. from both political, major political parties down there. So it seemed like they, there wasn't going to be a doubt that they would contribute if there was a conflict with China. Um, other questions uh, from the group uh, while they're thinking. Um, Chuck, I wanted to ask you. So we talked a little bit about you know. Uh, un unmanned systems or uncrewed systems coming from submarines. Uh, we talked just now about the cost of the SSNX that the Navy is uh, considering. Um, what are some of the implications of a new approach to undersea warfare along the lines of kind of what we've been discussing for submarine design? I mean, it seems like the, the current uh, type of submarines we're building with, the, which is the Virginia class with the Virginia payload module, very focused on you know, vertical launch capacity for missiles. Um, is that the model going forward? It seems like what we're talking about is much more about yeah, uncrewed undersea vehicles being launched by the submarine, which yeah. seems a lot more horizontal. Uh, it seems like if you have a lot of offboard systems like Kevin builds, maybe you need to focus a lot more on being able to do command and control um, of those other vehicles, and it's less about being a missile platform and more about being a, an undersea platform. Yeah, good question. So, so I don't think vertical is the answer mm -hmm. by itself. I think there's a lot of utility in having VLS, vertical launch system tubes, for weapons, for missiles, uh, but not for payloads. And the, if I had to say one word that's going to guide the future, SSNX, it's payload. Mm -hmm. We are already space limited on Virginia. <clears throat> and we, we perpetually design submarines that don't have the real capacity to expand. Right. And so the way they're going to tackle that with Flight 6 and 7 Virginia is put big extensions in the hull. 
which means you got a slower submarine, it's more cumbersome. The real answer is growing payload volume that is not touchable by expansion of org organic systems. It's reserved for payloads. Mm -hmm. You can launch and recover payloads horizontally, i.e. UUVs, or any other payload you want to drop. You have the ability to drop payloads. Mm -hmm. Coupled with that, you need the ability to communicate with the things <coughs> that you put out. And so there's a variety of ways we could tackle that. Acoustic communications works, but it's range limited. Mm -hmm. And it's also throughput limited, bandwidth limited. But if you have enough of them, large end sorts of things, you can daisy chain and make that a viable solution. So number one answer is payload. We have to have payload and we need horizontal payload. And how do we address this cost challenge? I mean, if, we, you know, if, the, if it ends up being a $6 billion ship, we won't be able to build, you know, it'd be challenging to build even two a year as we have been or trying to do with Virginia. Um, we're certainly not going to get to three or four per year. Um, how do we, you know, how can you contain the costs of the SSNX while also uh, optimizing or maximizing its payload capacity? You know, the submarine community has a whole list of things that they're really good at. Well, you let the submarine, the expensive platforms, do the ones that you can't completely address with offboard systems. Right. And those, those types of missions may involve offboard systems, autonomous systems, but they're not the focus of the effort. Let the unmanned systems, uncrewed, do th those, I call them menial, let's say less intensive tasks. It, and, and look, uh, underwater vehicles can be weaponized just like crewed right. platforms can. Right. So we need to think differently. We need numbers. We're not gonna build 100 SSNs. We can't afford it. They're too expensive. Right. Even adjusted for inflation, they're 10 times what they cost in the 60s. So we need to have a high-low mix of assets, volume where they're inexpensive, relatively speaking, better volume where they're exquisitely expensive, but the blended capability is what we need to go after. And so, Kevin, to that point, I mean, I guess, you know, we, if you're arguing, for, it's almost a big, small mix, you know, maybe, because even these small things are going to be pretty sophisticated, right? So. Uh, not to say that they're not, because a commercial technology can afford you that ability for a pretty automated, uh, uncrewed system. Uh, you know, so it's not necessarily um, a low, you know, capability. But but would you see that as the as the future? Is you know the the submarine kind of focuses on a pretty narrow set of of missions that it's really best for, and then you try to maximize the numbers of the uncrewed systems yep, that you use Absolutely, else. and as a representative of the uncrewed uh, commercial industry, Chuck, I do not uh, take offense to doing the menial tasks. <laughs> right. uh, in fact, that's what they should be doing, right? Boring tasks that human beings don't want to do that are not critical as part of a, you know, push the shiny red button. Uh, the machine shouldn't do that. Or that are really dangerous. Right, I mean, now to Chuck's point, you can weaponize them. We, we have demonstrated that very recently uh, with Fifth Fleet, but I, I'd say, um, those are, whether you're gonna be offensive or defensive or infrastructure degradation wise, as we talked about from the noise suppression or jamming or decoys, I, I really do agree with Chuck that, you know, even if it is a $6 billion, great, just make that one platform do the work of three of them by augmenting it with far less expensive network of things around it launched from the asset or not. But if you have enough of them distributed around, one of them in the old world would do the work of three of them in the new world. And, and so now you don't have a cost problem. In fact, you're actually spending less money, which is the way our entire society is evolving. Distributed assets, use of capital, Uber, DoorDash, these are using the same asset for more than one person or one mission set. And so you end up having distributed base of cost along with a distributed action of whatever application you're working on, whatever payload you put on board. But I think I absolutely agree with that. It's uh, this mix is where we got to get to. We just we're missing half of it right now. Right. Think of ring doorbell cameras. <laughs> you got one of two approaches to getting video in neighborhoods. One is to put a bunch of expensive cameras up on light mm -hmm. poles, mm -hmm. or use everybody's ring doorbell when you know when they want to share information. It's a great it's a great resource. So, so Jamie, as we wrap up here, I want to give you the, the last word. So you we're talking about this very different approach to undersea warfare than you know, what you and I grew up in, obviously you did it for a lot longer than I did, but I, you know, the, the idea of alone and unafraid, you know, kind of doing your own thing, limited communication with the outside world, it, it's a lot of fun, uh, yeah, but it's a big culture shift to now what, what you know, Kevin and, and Chuck are talking about, which is this more distributed network, you're having to work with a lot of other platforms, even you know, for every task, uh, and then also um, you know, fo focusing on narrow set of missions where you're not just the jack of all trades, you're really kind of a, you know, 
designed for a very specialized set of applications. Um, yeah, how, is the, how do we get the submarine force to, to you know, make this evolution? And then how do we you know, build out the capacity you know, of these other systems? Because I think otherwise we're not going to have that uh, volume or scale you know, that you need to be able to mount these new approaches. Yeah, a couple ideas on that. I mean, I really liked what I heard today. I'm a big believer in hybrid solutions to uh, the problem. I like what the Navy is doing with unmanned. I, I love what uh, you know, Commodore Brasseur and uh, Casey Moten did out in Fifth Fleet, did a podcast with those guys. Uh, they're brilliant, and now we've exported that to Fourth Fleet. So it is hybrid and unmanned are the way to go. Um, I think uh, distributed networks, and you know, we talked a lot about things today that fit under uh, the umbrella of JADC2, mm -hmm. uh, Joint All Domain Command and Control and Project Overmatch, and we're going to see more of that uh, come out in the future. Uh, we may see some of that play out in the uh, Large Scale Exercise 23. Uh, here right. in the next few weeks, which I'm involved in. Um, I will tell you that it is a mindset shift, Brian, what uh, you have proposed in your paper. Uh, some of the things uh, uh, I absolutely love, some of the things I, I still am thinking about, hunter killer to reconnaissance strike platform. But you know, I also remind myself um, as a dinosaur, I had a real problem with getting rid of paper charts. I was a navigator, I drew lines on charts. Uh, that's how we navigated, and when they went away on my boat when I was in command, I was like, what the hell am I going to do when this, paper, this electronic chart machine goes, you know, down? I mean, well, we have another one, sir. <laughs> and, oh, okay, well, you know, the SEALs say two is one, one is none. So uh, I wasn't real comfortable with that. I was never in command of a ship that had a non-penetrating periscope. Virginia class has a camera. I was used to, as we say, dancing with the one-eyed lady, you know, going around in circles. That was my life. It was painful. And I actually think that uh, the photonics mast is much better. It's less wear and tear on people and uh, less detectable. It's, it's better optics. It's great. And you, you control it with an Xbox. I was down on USS Montana. It was, it's great. And kids, you know, the sailors that are coming in nowadays love it. So I think we have to get over some of these stigmas that we're attached to and uh, move forward you know, into the future. And, uh, and I think that uh, the United States Navy and the submarine force got a great future. I have to get my last plug in for my friend Admiral Bowman. You know, 21 years ago, he came up with the four gets, uh, get electric, get payload, get modular, get connected. On the price of the SSNX, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves some tough questions. Of the four gets, which were revolutionary at the time and motivated naval reactors to look at electric drive, back then, everybody said, sir, it will cost a billion dollars. Because back then, a billion dollars was a lot of money. Now it's a trillion dollars, right? So they dropped it. But now we're going to make Columbia uh, an electric integrated propulsion plant. That's fantastic. Do we need to do that on the SSNX? I would ask that question. Could we keep the same propulsion plant as Virginia and save money? And I don't know how much money that would be, but I think it would be significant. Um, modularity is interesting. Uh, connectivity, we talked a lot about today. We've got to make improvements there. The real key is payload, and you guys said it. So focus on Bowman's get payload, less on the propulsion plant, which is good enough is good enough. That'll cut, cut costs. And let's get this submarine out there with a better payload, better connectivity to do these things in a distributed network and in consort with the hybrid systems that you're producing today. And I don't think anybody can touch us. So I'll leave Excellent. it there. That's right. It's a great place to end. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Chuck Freilich, uh, Kevin Decker from Ocean Arrow, Chuck Freilich from Lighthouse, and Jamie Fogo from the Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate your, your time and your questions, uh, and have a great day from the Hudson Institute.